Good morning, Energy Conversion Conservation Class. Uh, I'm not going to be able to uh, be in class at class time today, so I'm going to record the lecture right now, post it, and send you the link. So this is where we wound up last time. We're joking a little bit about uh, using uh, uh, installed gauges in the field. This shows one that uh, sat there for a long time uh, and it got removed and the pressure didn't change. Was installed, it probably wasn't giving a very reliable estimate of the situation. So we have to be careful about this. So here's another example. Um, it's got a calibration sticker on it, and uh, you can't quite see the end of the threads, but this one is removed as well. It was about 15, uh, what is that, 60, uh, almost 70, maybe 69. Yeah, about 69 PSI with a calibration sticker. Uh, no good. So, uh, gauges we see out there in the field are uh, usually the readings are considered somewhat suspect until we verify them with our own uh, uh, test gauges we know are operating correctly. Uh, and so, that's what this slide is uh, pointing out that on the right um, a calibrated uh, a gauge that uh, digital gauge that uh, was always good uh, and the one on the left uh, probably not so uh, if you want good data you would have to remove the one on the left and install uh, the one that you have confidence in and then send you the we do run into different types of flow meters out there, and we're just going to mention a few of them here. There are differential pressure uh, type meters, orifice, mercury, nozzle, elmo, etc. Uh, velocity based meters, magnetic, ultrasonic, ultrasound, uh, turbine, vortex jetting, uh, variable area, and pitot tubes. They're open flow, which would be here, positive. Placement here, uh, or mass flow meters, uh, lots of different types of flow meters. It's really a pretty complex area. Uh, so, if you're going to select one, uh, there's a bit of research to do, or just you can contact uh, companies that uh, sell them. They probably have good expertise in selecting the, the appropriate flow meter for a given application. Uh, some important Flow meter considerations, uh, proper flow profile on installation is critical. We have some pictures coming on that. Range, calibration, wear, uh, corrosion, scale, foreign material, how do they handle that? And sensing wind issues can be important. Okay, here's uh, what you sometimes see in the field, which is not very good. Uh, these things. Uh, we really need a number of 8, 10, 12, 15 diameters upstream, uh, probably a little bit less than that downstream, to uh, establish heat velocity profiles so that the meter can work uh, to its best uh, accuracy. And we see these things being shoehorned in all over the place. Uh, and they're just not going to give very accurate measurements if the velocity profile is. There's another, there's a mercury meter, I guess on this previous slide, we had a magnetic and an insertion type mercury flow meter. Again, you've got fitting all over the place and uh, your velocity profile. And you can't expect good accuracy on a meter like that. Here's a better configuration where we say we've got a long run or the meter, and then a pretty good run after the meter. Hopefully, those two valves on the downstream side are closed. Uh, would be helpful. Here's another good arrangement. This is actually on um, compressed air service. Uh, from, uh, looks like the flow is going up. You can see it with the green arrow on the tag, but uh, you've got a uh, uh, flow straightener for the flow meter to kind of smooth out the turbine better velocity profile. 
that sort of thing. Uh, electrical measurements, uh, that's one thing to consider. <laughs> Safety is always good when you take an electrical measurement. You have to be careful. You can hurt or kill yourself uh, if you get across it. Uh, this actually non casting Got his face shield, got his gloves on, he's got him. Probably standing on an insulated pad, which you're supposed to do. And he's got his jumpsuit on as well. So that's all recommended, the uh, safety standards. And there are a lot of standards published uh, for taking proper electrical measurements. So you do have to be careful. Uh, here's some more information. And I'm not going to do that. Uh, fundamental electric power relationships for single phase. Uh, we've got average power is the RMS current times the RMS voltage times the power factor. Um, and that would be watts. That's not if you want AW, you got to divide by a thousand. And we just lose the square root of three, which we have for three phase measurement. And he's noting here single phase. Um, that the voltage is uh, on to neutral voltage. Or you could take the instantaneous if you want an oscilloscope and um, take an average instantaneous current. Uh, probably what we're really going to do is, uh, if we want good measurements, is uh, use a three phase power meter, whatever we commonly. And so you just um, you know, you, uh, flip a CT around each of the three phases and then you measure the phase to phase voltage. Um, and the meter tells you everything that you want to know about it. Pretty much. Okay, moving on to just uh, a lot of times you're out there in the field, and you just can't measure uh, everything. And so we have to be creative, come up with ways to make things. Measure. So, in terms of reviewing important parameters to be read, measured, or estimated for something, system analysis, uh, what do we need? We need flow rate, pump head, motor input power, rotate, uh, rotational speed on the pump, nameplate information, rated speed, horsepower, full load amps, nominal efficiency, and then off the pump, pump down head speed. So a lot of stuff. But in many cases we just can't measure all these parameters. For example, flow rate sometimes you just can't measure. Or a lot of times I run into fill water systems and strip off any insulation for you. you put on a strap on the ultrasonic flow meter and you just have to get the air pipe. You know, Tennessee Tech uh, measurement before and we'll go look around and you know, have brand new propane insulation. You look at uh, Randy Loftus and he says, I'm sorry, I just paid them ten thousand dollars for this insulation. We're not gonna get it with these so you just can't do it. So uh, our voltage is about uh, six hundred volts. So pretty difficult. So you can imagine that you're at uh, expanded or uh, increased uh, danger. So you, you got to really know what you're doing for those stuff. So they call that medium voltage, so high voltage. Sorry for the, I don't know, greater than a thousand signal. That goes on like that. So what the utility is distributing that. So what can we do? Well, if uh, if we have a portable flow meter and we can get this pipe, then we can essentially take a measurement. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, even when you can get the pipe. You can have corrosion and you can have buildup of uh, scale or something on the inside of the pipe, and the ultrasound is going to get through. You can be pumping a fluid with a lot of particulates that may dissipate the ultrasound, and you just can't get the measurement of that. You know, if it's a clean pipe and we got a good clean fluid, then most likely it's going to work. Not always. Uh, so we can make uh, estimate from a pump head 
measurement in a pump curve. So we can measure the pressures and all the information, go to the pump head calculator and keep that or me measure and determine the pump head. And then if we have the curve, uh, we can use the head and go over to the curve and down to the flow rate. Other process parameters such as we can do a heat balance on heat exchange that can help you. And from a component pressure drop, like if we have a valve, you can use a valve or a two bundle on a chiller as a flow meter if you can measure the delta P and have some information about the characteristics of it. So here's an example. The ultrasonic flow meter can work at work. Like about a two foot diameter pipe. Well, you could even you could use those on a pretty large pipe, measuring seven thousand two hundred one ppm. Uh, uh, this is a magnetic coupling uh, to the pipe. These rails hold the transducers. These are ultrasonic transducers down here. Wire connections that go to the meter, and we don't, that's just the spring on the meter. We don't say the whole meter in this picture. So, uh, another uh, thing we can do is we can uh, time the change in level, uh, either increasing or decreasing a tank, and we know that it went up, say, three feet. Three feet, and we know how long it took to do that. We know the geometry of the tank, and we can calculate a flow rate from that information pretty easily. Uh, this is just taking a gauge elevation, so using the flow rate as a datum, it's non measuring, it's taking a measure. Maybe measuring the top of the gauge, the middle of the gauge, the bottom of the gauge, whatever. And then uh, you see up here, you can measure this one and this one, and those are the elevate gauge elevations. Get into the uh, Here's uh, step one estimate head uh, from test gauges at the P2 and P3 gauge locations, like what we just found on the previous slide. So let's see, both gauges are in 10 inch pipe, so they have the same diameter, upstream and downstream. Uh, suction gauge uh, 24.2 is on the discharge gauge 95.3. Uh, suction gauge elevation, we're taking that to be zero. The discharge is uh, feet below that. Uh, nothing, no loss, just straight pipe. Side and uh, straight pipe to gauge on the discharge side. So, no uh, loss coefficient for N, uh, 2000 GPM, and we do about 166 feet. Okay. So, with that, then we go to the pump curve at 166 feet, we open it down, and we do uh, 2250. I see we really didn't know. Now what you can do in, in this head calculation, we estimated it at 2,000. You could then go back and you could iterate the timers in a couple of times. So now we're at uh, 2250, and that would affect the pump a little bit. So you can put 2250 in here, get a revised pump bounce pad. And it should, it'll send that down to what we should be. Uh, okay, a few uh, possible gotchas here. The um, pump head capacity curve is developed at a different speed. So uh, if you don't measure the rotational speed, you don't know. I mean, the, the major operating speed that the pump manufacturer publishes the curve, and it's probably not true. If it's below some speed, it probably means it's 
difference. Uh, and if it's 20, 30 or 300, it, it makes it, you know, faster, most likely faster than it could be. And then it would affect your estimate your quality. Uh, our pressure gauges may not be right. Uh, the pump specific curve is for your pump is not, excuse me, is not equal to the uh, pump generic curve, which is a factor. Um, the impeller or other parts may be worn, so the pump curve may not be wise. So you don't have a curve, you don't know the impeller diameter. Uh, are the manufacturers exaggerating? Well, maybe a few, but okay. So those are all. Uh, pump rotational speed can uh, usually be easily and accurately measured with a strobe light. If you have a strobe flash, you can adjust the flash rate of that strobe within a tenth of an RPM. And we get it pretty much correct. The gap looks like it needs to be. And it's not actually rotating. So, uh, and it's typical to find pumps operating at greater uh, than the speeds at which. Rated because the motor is typically oversized. Uh, this, uh, uh, 40 horse motor is probably going to mount 35, 40, 42 horse, which means it's going to speed up a little bit. But even if the, the motor at full load was matched perfectly to the pump uh, at its rated speed, uh, if the motor is not fully loaded, then it will be rotating faster. Uh, and so Perhaps a need to adjust the pump curve. And so that's what we're showing here is a situation where the manufacturer's curve was given at 1750, and we actually took a strobe, we measured the rotation speed at 1780, and then so we took points off of the initial curve and uh, used the affinity laws to draw the 1780 curve or even go back to the manufacturer. Not very hard to do. So in this case, at our 166 feet of lift, the expanded curve at 1780 RPM would put it at 2430 GPM or 8% higher than if we use the 1750 curve. So that's an 8% difference. Uh, what if uh, you have the manufacturer's generic curve set, but you're not color diameter because on the manufacturer, if, if you don't have the specific curve uh, for the pump when it was selected, you just have the generic curve and you've got all you've got numerous different impeller diameters and you're not necessarily sure which one you have installed. You can't find the documentation. On it. So, you know, at, uh, at 166 feet of head, if you assume you and three eighths on the diameter impeller, you're 2250, or 14 and five eighths, you're 2430, and if you're 14 and seven eighths, you're 2610. So, pretty good amount of difference, you know, for the same pump head, depending on which impeller. That's why they make different impeller diameters. Okay, so what do we do here? Well, one interesting trick, you can do it quickly. If you can measure the shutoff head, so you can just deadhead the pump very briefly and see, you know, for the smaller impeller is going to have a shutoff head of about 203, the medium size impeller will be about 210, so uh, 218 and 219, something like that. So you can um, measure shutoff head. Quickly, uh, <laughs> quickly at that because you don't want to put the pump so slow down and dead end for very long. Uh, what if wear ring clearance uh, was opened? Uh, can speed change uh, when deadheaded? You know, that's uh, another possibility. So you could take your strobe. Uh, I would expect it would slow up. Um, certainly it would because. Uh, all it's doing is turning in there. So uh, I'm pretty sure that you would get a C 
screen into bed here, and you had to take that into consideration. Uh, you need to show that, make your determination already, and tell her it's diameter. So it comes from rising power curves, which means more flow, more power, and they're not all that way. I'd say the majority are. You could uh, measure electrical power, you could use ESAT to estimate that, and then the estimated shaft power to the manufacturer's power. And that might give you some idea of which uh, impeller you would want. Uh, some related uh, good general practices. Uh, if you're doing a lot with pumps, buying pumps, moving heaven in the sky, etc., request, pay for a certified test curve. Pay the manufacturer and get 500 bucks to get them to take your pump and test it and give you a, a very specific curve for your pump. Which, would, if it's a critical pump, uh, that's not a bad idea. Uh, when possible, have tested with the motor uh, that will be used in actual service. So not only the pump, but you know, get the actual motor there, let it drive. After installation, uh, benchmark field performance against uh, test facility data. Uh, so, do a good evaluation after it's installed and do regular hydraulic performance tests. That's a good general practice. Uh, here we have a case study to illustrate flow estimation from pressure measurements. So, the head capacity curve, this was at Oak Ridge. Um, 97, 67, 12, almost. Anyway, so repeat versus flow. Uh, pump discharge, permanently installed pressure gauge reads uh, 2.5 psi to the flow, so it's reading about 40. We got 42 and a half on the uh, better uh, pressure gauge that we have some confidence in. And on the discharge side, the uh, pump section, permanently installed gauge, reads 1.3 uh, high. So, uh, the, uh, the good gauge is reading 0.17. And so, so gauge is 1.3 above that. Okay, so we're going to use those pressures uh, to gather the pump head, and then we're going to go into the pump curve. So I should be doing three different sets of measurements here. We've got the permanent pressure gauges, which uh, produced a, a pump head of 39.3 feet, which puts the pictures right out here on the pump curve. And then if you read down, that's 535 BPM. Uh, test pressure gauges uh, is anchored around 48 feet. And so the higher head pushes you back on the pump curve to here, which is 450 GPM. And then we actually had a magnetic flow meter, flow meter 30. So we assume this one is correct, and we're actually going to go here. And so we see that the permanent gauges, uh, if we use it for flow estimation, we would be plus 24%. Not a very good uh, estimate. Test gauges would be plus five percent, which is obviously not bad. So you know it's not too bad compared to what we assume is the correct measurement of 430 GPM. Uh, Anity check. We can use other process parameters. Is he's writing uh, M dot CP delta T? So in US units, CP is one, so he doesn't even write it. And if at these temperatures, the density is roughly the same. So instead of ratioing mass flow rates, he's measuring uh, ratioing volume flow rates, but at constant density, it would be the same ratio. So Don's pretty slick. So basically, uh, GPM times delta 
n is equal to g m times delta g out. And so we're, we don't know in the process two, we don't know the flow rate, but we see that uh, we assume that all of the, that there's no heat loss from the heat exchange. Um, and so the 600, 6,000 GPM times the 8 degree GP would be equal to the GPM on the other side times the 6 degree GP. And so he uses that to solve for the flow rate process too, and it comes out 8,000 GPM. Uh, you could be a little more accurate. If there was a bigger difference in temperature, you would only be able to use flow rates, but this is essentially the same. Very close in temperature, so this is probably a pretty good estimate. Okay, another trick here uh, we can use valve differential pressure to estimate flow. So this has a very nice flow control valve, and these are pressure taps, and so we can measure the pressure drop. Uh, John's going up or down here, but anyway, if this valve is uh, throttling the flow, then there'll be a pressure drop in the process. You can take the information and say go to the valve pool. Uh, if you know the C V, yeah, this rich run is this is calculating flow from C V, so or you can measure delta G, whatever you just use the valve tool to turn this valve into a flow meter for you. Yeah. So if you knew the delta P and you knew the C V on the valve based on the position, you can go ahead and then this will calculate your flow rate. In this case, I don't know if this is one GPM, but it is 17.6. That's a lot of flow through that valve, so I don't think this picture necessarily that's the that's the theory. Okay. Um, an important piece of information here. Uh, the valve characteristic must be known. Uh, this is not a precision flow measurement. So these lines, this shows the flow coefficient for the valve position. And this is the allowable deviation uh, as per ISA 75 not 11. So you see, uh, you know, it, it's, there's, there's a pretty wide uh, band around this that's allowable by standard. You know, they may publish 430 or 420, and it could be all the way it could be all the way down to so a lot of a good bit of variation in this. So you can get an estimate of flow. So we got so we got nominal C V, max, min, uh, estimated time is estimated by uh, the system for the measurement position. <laughs> so we see so in the nominal where we're reading the value is 430, but it could be as high as 45 or as low as 44 until satisfy the ISA standard for tolerance. Um, percent of nominal 13.3 percent. You get some, some variation based on that. Okay, so this is a, this is an interesting uh, trick. Nom's pretty cagey. Field measurements. So, an effective way to measure flow rate uh, in parallel pumping applications is to use the Bernoulli equation. And so, what we've got here, <laughs> uh, let's see, the black pumps are off. So, we're running one and four and we're two and three. So, what you can do, because we know the total hydraulic load, uh, and that includes pressure, elevation, velocity, should be the same. In the suction pump. Okay. So if you come back here at this gauge, these gauges, that total here should be the same. Okay, whether uh, uh, the running and the idle pump. So we should get the same total pressure here as we would get up here. Okay, but now this, no, we're not pressure, which is a uh, total, total hydraulic energy. But since there's no velocity in the idle pumps, because you know, we're not, there's nothing flowing through here, 
uh, pressure would be higher than those that are running. So by measuring the differences in pressures, the block rule and the suction uh, can be reduced. So let's say if this was 100 psi and this was 110 psi, that 10 psi difference is the velocity head. And then velocity head would be squared over 2g. So then, you know, velocity head n times 2g, uh, take the square root of it. The velocity, average velocity in the diameter of the pipe, and flow. Uh, so this is really a pretty uh, interesting trick. Be a good homework problem, maybe. Okay, uh, let's see. So the coffee time. How about power estimation? PSAT. Estimate estimates of uh, power from current have proven to be reasonably accurate. Linear current ratio, and this is measured amps divided by full load amps equal a fraction of rated load, is a very poor setting for it. Uh, there's software out there called Motor Master, which is pretty good. Uh, it helps you estimate uh, power. And speed. Uh, you know, we know from a motor tag, we know the motor speed at rated power. For example, our motor operational uh, speed on the tag might be 1750. And so, if you measure it at 1775, you could say that it's running 50% output power. But unless we have really a calendar. Uh, speed power calibration curve, uh, it tends to not be just terribly accurate. So that's kind of a last case uh, scenario for you. Okay, so we've got some examples here. Piece out example one. Say application uh, greater than 40 year old motor. That's getting pretty old for 200 horsepower, four, four pole. And this speed is 1800, probably running someplace around 1740, 1750 RPM. Comparison of electric power estimated from current and voltage measurement to actual uh, electric power. So I'm going to measure the both amps and that, and then we're going to measure the power compared. So that's the overall piece of the screen, but you don't have to read that. Cut and paste and pulled out uh, the uh, power uh, information. The not relevant. So we measure here's motor amps was 215.5472, and the uh, measured power was 156.3. That we measured and put in, we measured and put in. And of course, the flow rate was uh, 17, 18, and the head was 306. So, you know, it was just sitting there running, and we just took different types of power measurements. Okay, so the output for um, condition A is the uh, PSAT pulls the power factor. and this was a uh, uh, standard efficiency motor. Uh, so we say motor efficiency 94% power factor uh, 86.4. And so this is the input for the uh, current. Uh, and so motor power is uh, 153.2 kW, that's the input power. And let's see, so on the power measurement, we measured 156.3, so the current data is running but, not running, but it is 
our meter. Okay, we signed an example two. Comparison of PCAT testimony for laboratory test data. <clears throat> and test data source that is for non intrusive motor efficiency estimators, motor system resource facility, Oregon State University. Uh, prepared for an interest energy efficiency alliance. And the following slides MM stands for Motor Master, and that's the DOD database software uh, that has all kinds of motor algorithms in it. Okay, so how accurate uh, uh, do you expect field data to be? So uh, the Field data uh, with PSAT uh, looks like it's uh, pretty good. This is percent error. Uh, motor master, uh, not as good, but still 1% or less. Uh, this is just uh, looking at motor size 50, 100, 200 horsepower. And then product error, product two, we don't know exactly what. Shaft power. So this is uh, estimating the shaft power on measured KW. So then this is current based estimate. So if you, instead of measuring KW, if you measure current, or put it in, then they're not as good. So say here's the here's the current measure uh, percent errors. Motor sizes are four, four and a half, and uh, 2.2 or something versus all the PSAT. If you're measuring power, this is uh, so this, this was, these are input power measurements, and this is estimating shaft power, brake force power out of the motor. So basically, it's the efficiency, it's how well do these different uh, tools estimate motor efficiency. And then also on the amp measurement, you have to estimate power penetration. So like that. You see, uh, PSAT's much better than Motor Master. We get some really huge deviation with Motor Master with amp measurements. KWS is pretty bad. So, uh, and this uh, important point most of the current based error comes from low load conditions. So if you look a lot of rated load and you look at the motor size, you see you get uh, most of the variation back here at really pretty low, say up to maybe 50% and down in load when you get above 50, 60% on up to 100, and that gets much better uh, if you're measuring electrical current. Uh, <clears throat> this shows uh, in terms of Arc, uh, PSAT's not alone, uh, but fortunately, most pump motors sell them to really like loads. So, you know, while we get big air back here, chances are you may not encounter this very frequently. Okay, some other just uh, general comments here a caution about sample current measurements. The CTU drop rate here is critical, so this is the CT. Which around the wire and here Don took a little piece of IRAP and put it so that the jaws couldn't completely close and make electrical contact and it shows that when the jaws are fully closed the proper measurement is 114.2 amps but with this inserted in here it's only less than 0.05 inch gap the measurement falls to 78.5 Make sure that you put the case closed properly. I've never found that to be much of a problem. But good thing is that. Also, an interest to measure all three phase to phase voltages. So that would be like AB, AC, BC, and look at the variation. There are public standards. I don't remember exactly what the variation is, but uh, much more than say five percent. You probably have a problem uh, with the motor, and there's different, uh, uh, different uh, allowable differences uh, on the voltage 
in the current. I don't. I don't remember. But uh, you can look it up. It's pretty easy. Okay, the final uh, most important consideration demand and supply in the engineering domain. There is often a difference between what the pump is providing to the system and what the system really needs. Try to think of it in terms of demand, not supply. And so we have to come together on that. And so we do that with a throttle valve or something. Not so good. So to illustrate this, consider a real world cold water pumping application. This is one of Oak Ridge Buildings W uh, 7939 has uh, multiple heat exchangers, so chiller, and we've got pump at the end of the chiller, and we can pump something away from the chiller through heat exchanger. So this is this is just nice. Pressure drop a lot of distance. And we have multiple pumps for circulating fluid through it. And we're going to concentrate on the initial focus areas down here on this J106 pump, P3 suction and P4 discharge. And we've got suction strainers here to protect the pump. Go throughout any large chunks of stuff. Okay, so uh, we've cut and pasted portions of that condition A. So this is the nameplate data for the pump 1750 RPM, direct drive, and water, and stage, uh, motor 60 hertz, 24 power, motor rated RPM 1760, voltage rated voltage 480. And we're not listing any service factor on the side of the motor. For the motor. Okay. So we go out in the field and say we've got a gauge over here, we've got a gauge over here, and we've got pressure and pipe diameters. So we plug all that stuff in the head calculator and we piece it. So we say, well, we got six inch pipe on both sides. Okay. Here's our pressure gauge reading. 31.4 on the suction, 80.8 on discharge, elevation 3.3, 4.7, and we don't have any uh, loss coefficients. So this is gravity is one standard water and 450 ppm. So this gives us 115.5. Um, so the combined pump and motor are good. So we do the analysis, put in the rounds at 16.8, and our display is 116. So we have in there, uh, 450 ppm. There's a measured amps and volts. So we can input data. And 68.4% efficiency on the pump, which gives us an optimization rating 87, so that's pretty good. Optimal, uh, we're doing about 76.9 uh, to replace the pump, but we see the operating cost is, it would only save, it would save us a thousand dollars. So I don't know, we probably four or five thousand dollars. Well, not a super good guy, but that's fine. We're doing pretty good. Okay, but we go a little further downstream, we expand our field of vision a little bit. So we can see the floor and we say, oh, look at this. Throttled butterfly. And so we're able to make the pressure drop, which across this valve. We see there's a 23 PSI. Now, the downstream pressure is estimated to be 55 psm at 10 feet off the ground. So let me put that in because that's the effective pressure. I generate all this high pressure in here, but then I drop it across the valve. So my effective pressure difference in the system is the suction for the discharge. And so 
by recalculating my required pump head uh, based on that information while I change uh, this downstream pressure to 55 and I put it at an elevation of 10 feet because that's you know, from that point out, that's what is actually forcing the fluid to the system. And I get the pump head that I really need. Not this drop here, then my pump will really need to produce uh, uh, 61.23 feet of force. So now we're doing that to put that in CSAT, and all of a sudden my pump efficiency for what I really need for the system, see my power is still the same. I draw, I have the flow rate, I put in the head that I really need on the pump, and based on this amount of power, that's a Not very good. My optimization rate falls to 45.3. So uh, I've got opportunity here. So instead of the $7,500, if uh, replace this thing, turn the impeller, slow it down, replace the pump, do something, uh, I can operate this $3,400 a year. So that's uh, 4100 100 in savings. Math for me. So that might be worth looking at. Maybe you could replace that pump for that. Or if only if you wanted to do it for VFD. Oh, you probably put a VFD on that thing for 3,000, 3,500, or you could come with a power much cheaper than that. You got options. Uh, let's look at an example system. This is one of my favorites, and this is what we end up in something like that. So let's just say that you know, we just started doing an analysis on this system. And so we got a suction tank, discharge gauge, uh, suction gauge, ultrasonic flow meter, and we're going to start right there and just look at the pump operation. And then we'll expand it out there. So here's all of my measurements, uh, my field stuff. Uh, I get up the suction pressure 4.3, 7 feet in the floor, like my limiter. My suction rate 3.5, discharge 89.2, PSIG 4.4 feet in the floor, uh, pipe my uh, ID, these are IDs. And 12.25 inches, uh, flow meter at 60.1 GPM, uh, it's a medium voltage motor, the main plate 2300 volts, uh, 80, RPM, 80 amps at rated load, measured uh, current voltage 77 amps at 2320 volts, then suction pipe um, measured the speed 1190 RPM. Operates 90% of the time and electricity is expensive. 13 cents. This may be my first piece of address someplace. Maybe it's outside the country. I don't know where it was. Okay. So uh, let's go get our pump head. So we put all of our information into the pump head calculator. Uh, we do have section line loss, coefficient uh, 0.5, and this. We get a pump head of about 193 feet. And we go to CSAT. So here's our measured voltage 2320, current 77, 6193 feet of head, zero And wow, we get 87.8% efficiency. That's pretty good. We get an optimization rating over here of 97.7. We made a real good grade right there. That's a happy pump that works for me. Okay. Doing a great job of pushing 6100 GPM. So we check. Let's check the pump curve. And sure enough, we come in at 6100 feet up and over. 90 something feet 
head, uh, rear right on the pump curve, which is where you would like to be. It shows that the pump's in good operating condition. Uh, we can check the efficiency. Uh, there's, there's a flow rate curve, so at 6100, we're reading about 88%, which is DDP, best efficiency point. Really happy where it's operating. Pumps love to operate at or close to their best efficiency point. Again, we're doing great. Uh, so, I mean, hey, life is good for this pump, right? DPP, 97.6% optimization rate. But let's see, let's go a little bit further downstream and see how this. Okay, we go a little bit further, and oh my gosh, look at this. What is this pipe here? Oh, it's a recirculation line. That's going right back to the same. And this valve V2, my gosh, it's wide open. So all of a sudden, we realize that this 100 BPM up here, some of it's going out to the system, and some of it's going to be And that pumping water around in a circle is just waste, unless there's some reason that you have. Case the damage doesn't. So that represents the place the damage. Okay, so let's look at let's look at this a little bit here. So flow rate was not measured. The recirculation at valve V2 position was known to be full open. Picture similar valve and this is the CV versus valve position or wide open. And measures you know, about 375, 376, something like that. So, using valve performance data, pipe component uh, geometric data, and measured pressures, the flow rate through the recirculation line was estimated to be 2940 GPM. Thus, so the pump's pushing 6100, 2940 is running around in a circle, 3160 is going out to the system. Oh, my. All of a sudden, that energy is just all over the place. Okay. So let's take a look. So what we've done is we copied A to B, and then we simply changed the flow rate because we're still using 77 amps. The voltage is still 2320. My pad is still 193, but my effective flow that I need for my system is 3160. So what's that do? Let's look at condition B. So that makes my effective pump efficiency 45.5%, not so good. And my grade, my optimization rating is what's that? 51.6, I believe. So I went from making 97 to 98. Uh, failed the exam. Don't call home yet. <laughs> we have a revision in grade. Uh, so there's a dramatic uh, effect on the outcome. Optimization rating drops from 97 to 51. Again, didn't look at the money, but let's look at this. From if we replace this pump with an optimal pump. Uh, we could save over $131,000 per year. Now, that's inflated some because of the high electrical cost, but still, I mean, if that's what you're paying for electricity, that's a real number. So, uh, we've got some significant energy in this thing. Okay, let's go on. Let me go further downstream. Oh, my goodness, what is this valve? What is this V1 guy doing here? Oh, it's throttling. To my actual process, my discharge tank. Hmm. Well, my gosh, so even so this pump is so big, I basically recycle almost half the flow and I have to throttle it down here to get this flow down to 3160, which is what the pump says. Oh my goodness. So here's a picture of the valve, and you see the position indicator. Uh, if this red line was straight across and closed, if it was up and 
down uh, vertical, wide open, so we're at 40 minutes halfway in between, so it's 50% open. Okay, so here's my CB curve. There's a picture of it. So I read up and over, and I get CB is 50% position. Here's 476. And I can go use my valve uh, equation, U and CB, uh, delta square to delta B, over specific gravity. So plug in the numbers in. And remember, there is a geometry factor here, but so long as the pipe and the valves are all the same diameter, then that geometry factor one, I don't have to worry about it. Uh, if it's different, then I need to go to use that. In this case, I don't need to. So uh, the calculation shows that the pressure drop is 34 psig across that valve uh, at 31.2 low and CB at 476. Um, however, in this case, we were actually able to measure the pressure drop, and it measured 39 instead of 34. So now things don't really interact. The 39 is better, so we'll use the 39 going forward. So 39 PSIG for standard water times 2.31 is 90 feet. So in other words, you're dropping 90 feet across that valve, but that valve was open and the pump was properly sized, we could save 90 feet. So instead of 193 feet, I'm gonna put 103 feet, which is the flow that I actually need. And this is what I'm still using, so I leave the power on. And now my existing efficiency on the pump goes to 24.3, and my optimization reading is down to less than 28, 27.7. So this is really an inefficient system. Now the pump itself is operating great, but it's pushing 6,100 GPM against a throttle valve. I'm recircling 2940, and I've got an extra 90 feet drop across the valve. And that's energy waste. So, uh, if you look at the optimal case, uh, if I replace this thing, I could do this with a 100 horsepower pump and achieve uh, an optimally selected pump to be. 88.5% efficient, and this would save me $196,000 a year. And that's just a good cost of about $75,000. It's been $271,000. So uh, now this is obviously you don't run into these uh, wasteful systems every day, uh, nonetheless, uh, they are out there. And it's just to illustrate uh, how you have to take a, a system approach. Versus, I mean, it's fine to look at the pump and determine that the pump has a problem, but you have to look at the entire system to make sure that uh, you're doing this as efficiently as possible. So, see, this is where the ultimate goal would come in. You look at uh, an ultimate goal, you look at the 30, well, 30, 60 GPM that you need and what's a reasonable about ahead, but then you look at what you're spending and you go, something's wrong. You know? I'm spending way too much money on this. Okay, and so the concluding remark basically uh, some people actually think that they should use a throttling valve to move closer to DEP so that you reduce money, and that's rarely, if ever, a good idea. Um, and so just because you have efficient pump motor operation, Probably not an indication of effective or efficient system operation. You have to look at the whole system. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure we're going to do these additional case studies. I'll have to look at it, but I'm going to cut this off right here and post this. Uh, we're not going to meet in class today. I will let you know that in the uh, email that I sent. So I hope everybody has a great uh, morning. And I'll see you guys.